Hello everyone. I hope you're having a great Sunday. Um, it's a bit rainy here and um, I had a bit of a late night out. Um, I don't really go out much but it was a friend's birthday and so I found myself in a nightclub last night until about 2.30 in the morning and uh, I'm now back home after staying at a friend's house last night and I've been thinking about Lucy Letby's case. I mean, I spoke to my friend about the case um, in great detail and enlightened her about it. And she was flabbergasted by what I told her. And hopefully she'll spread the word. That's how we're going to make a change here, is if we all spread the word. We talk to the people we know. Don't be ashamed of what you know, because there's nothing to be ashamed of. The people who should be ashamed are the people who got this innocent girl convicted by lying or by misrepresenting information, which is the same as lying. Anyway, this isn't the video I was going to do today. I was intended to do a video about the hygiene problems at the hospital, which has been extensively covered elsewhere, but I thought I'd bring your attention to that. However, I came across this article. It's an article from August. I think it's August. Let me see if, if I got the date right. I'll tell you when it's from, if I can find the date. I think it's from 2014 anyway. Sometime in 2014, this article, which is on the justicegap.com website. So if you look up thejusticegap.com and it's entitled how to become sorry let me speak properly how to become a convicted serial killer without killing anyone so let's start this article remember the t-shirt join the british army go to interesting places meet interesting people and kill them. Well, it's kind of similar, but a bit more sinister. You're not going to join the army. No, nope, you're not going to join the nursing. You are going to join the nursing profession. And then it lists the ways to become a convicted serial killer without killing anyone. So number one, become a nurse. Make sure you are not quite the usual run of the mill nurse. It doesn't matter in what way you are different, as long as it's noticeable. Or example, or it should be for example, you are a guy or a bit better educated than most other nurses, or you come, you came to nursing after previous careers, preferably in something a bit fishy, have a big mouth, get a reputation for standing up for yourself and kindly pointing out when other people seem to be making big mistakes, even if they are, God forbid, Doctors. Does that sound like anyone? Number two. Now sit back and wait. Sooner or later, you are on a ward where people often die. They do have such wards in hospitals, you know. Wait a bit longer. Wait for an unexplained cluster of cases. This is 2014. Wait for a cluster of cases. Actually, as any statistician can tell you, unexpected clusters of cases are exactly what you should expect when events are completely random and completely independent of one another. Remember those three airline, uh, airliners crashing in three days just a few weeks ago? So in 2014, there must have been three planes that crashed within three days. <clears throat> Statisticians will also explain that when things are slowly changing in hospital environments, the seasons, new staff with new habits regarding how to classify events on NHS forms, new policy, for example, close down one ward to save money and get a new kind of patient, an old ward, etc. The phenomenon of big gaps and tight clusters is strengthened. Psychologists and neuroscientists will tell you about cognitive biases. The events are not actually independent. One event triggers more being noticed and registered. Number three, 
Now we need the trigger, an unexplained death and a paranoid doctor. Well, unfortunately, um, the hospital, hospital in Chester, where Lucy Letby um, worked, had, well, I, maybe they're paranoid. Maybe I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. And these, these doctors were paranoid and they weren't just lying to protect themselves from a disciplinary process and to have having to apologise to a nurse who was being bullied. Maybe they were just paranoid. Anyway, this is number three. And this is 2014. This is two years before the events that led to Lucy Bet Letby being um, locked up. So now we need the trigger, an unexplained death and paranoid doctors. This is like spark and gunpowder. Let's look at the gunpowder first. The key doctor... Well, in stressful situations, everyone is paranoid, right? It's another of those damned cognitive biases. Just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not all out to get me. So let's not use the word paranoid. Let's say stressed or suggestible. Now the spark, the key event. We also need an event to trigger the doctor's thinking, the spark which causes the gunpowder to explode. This should be a notable, unexpected occurrence which is associated with that equally notable nurse we were previously talking about. The odd one, who always seemed to be there when there was some kind of upset. The one with the big mouth and the odd background. This is easy. What we also need is an unexpected death. That is easy too. Why unexpected? Because people had made the wrong diagnosis or were not aware of the full facts, even if they were right there in the patient's dossier and had no time to go through that stack of paper yet. Notice if someone is critically ill and about to die, they are going to die today or tomorrow or the next day. But typically, the exact moment of the next crisis is not predictable. Well, in hindsight, yes, but not in advance. Doctors may have said things to the family, for example, he, she is going to is doing well, should go home next week, when they really mean this is close to the end, nothing more than more we can do, better to die at home. That can even be a hospital policy. Not everyone has full information. In fact, almost nobody does. There is no full Im information. Everyone has snippets, often out of context, often wrong. Now everything has clicked in someone's mind and the link is made between the scary nurse the disturbing event, and we had a lot more cases like that recently. For example, the seasonal bump in resp respiratory arrests. Seven this month, but usually it's just one or two. Notice the number used here, seven. But noticeably, normally it's usually just one or two. So this is kind of what they were saying with the Lucy Letby case. Normally they have one or two deaths on that ward per year, but this time they had seven. I mean, you couldn't make it up. This guy wrote this two years before it happened. He must be psychic. Anyway, the hurried trawling expedition, the spectra of a serial killer has now taken possession of the mind of first doctor who got alarmed. He or she rapidly spreads the virus to his close colleagues. Exactly what happened in the Lucy Letby case. He started calling her Dr. Death or Nurse Death and all sorts of things which led to her raising a grievance against him. They talked together and agreed to do some work. They start looking at other seemingly similar recent cases and they let their minds fall back to the other odd things which happened in recent months and stuck in their minds. The scary nurse had also stuck in their minds and they connect the two. They go trawling and soon they have 20 or 30 incidents, which is... Ex Roughly what they had, in this case, 20 or 30 incidents that they decided to go through to see if she was working on those days. And then when they found she wasn't working on all of them, they decided that they were going to eliminate those ones from the information that they gave to the police. So 20 or 30 incidents, which are now bothering them. They check each one for any sign of involvement of the scary nurse. And if he's involved or she's involved in this case, the incident quickly takes on a very sinister look. Hindsight, right? On the other hand, if she was on a week's vacation, then obviously everything must have been okay and the case is forgotten. 
<sighs> Number five. The Hurried Medical Conference. Another conference gather some dossiers, half a dozen very suspicious cases to report to the police to begin with. You see where this is going. The process of retelling the medical history of these star cases has already started. Everyone who was involved and knew something about the screw-ups and mistakes says nothing about them but confirms the fears of the others. Medical Collegi uh, collegiality, <laughs> sorry, that's very difficult to pronounce. That's a relief. There was a killer around. It wasn't my prescription mistake or an oversight of some complication, complicating condition. The dossier which will go to the police and importantly, the layman's summary written by the coordinator doctor, coordinating doctor, does contain truth, but not the whole truth, like the deleted columns for doctors who were working at the same time as Lucy Letby and happened to be at all the murders. That didn't happen. And there is even more truth outside the hospital dossiers. A, <clears throat> a culture of lying. A, this is 2014. This, do, this guy is saying there is a culture of lying. The covering up of mistakes. What have I been saying? What have I said in my first video? What have I said in my most recent video, the covering up of mistakes. Anyway, a lot of the information in the dossiers is wrong, corrupted, misclassifications galore. Important documents are lost. Important forms never got filed in the pro in properly. Medical care is not an exact science. According to recent NHS statistics, many men are in NHS hospitals because of pregnancy. Their own pregnancies see here. I don't know what that means. According to recent NHS statistics, many men are in NHS hospitals because of pregnancy. Their own pregnancy. Well, I don't know. I'm not even going to click on the link. I have no idea what that's talking about. A man who's pregnant. Anyway, the police. So that's number six. The police are called in. An arrest is made. There is, of course, an announcement inside the hospital and there has to be an announcement to the press. Now, of course, the director of the hospital is in control, probably misinformed by his doctors, obviously having to show his damage control capacities and to minimise any bad PR for the hospital. The PR department, the management, the legal department are all working full throttle in this damage control exercise. The whole thing explodes out of control and the media feeding frenzy starts. A witch hunt followed by a witch trial. The only thing they didn't do is dunk Lucy Letby in the water to see if she died, because that's what they used to do. She was only one step away from that happening. Then, of course, there is also the bad luck. In the case of Ben Gein, it was the syringe. It was allegedly alleged that between December 2003 and February 2004, at least 17 patients suffered respiratory arrest for unknown reasons and Gein was on duty during these incidents. incidents. He was arrested in 2004 and an empty syringe found in his pocket. He had perfectly good innocent explanation for why the syringe was there, which moreover corresponds to what was actually in it, but you won't find that reported in the media. Instead, you will find statements that it contained a toxic combination of drugs, pure fantasy. Well, I don't know enough about that, so I'm not going to get into that. I mean, I, I heard about the syringe and even I thought it was highly suspicious. And until I read something or see something that justifies him having a syringe in his pocket when he was arrested. I mean, he's a, he is a medical practitioner, so there are lots of syringes in the hospital. There might be many reasons for having a syringe in his pocket. But yeah, someone's going to have to convince me on that one. Anyway, this is what Wendy Hesketh, she's a lawyer writing a book on the topic, wrote. I agree with your view on the politics behind incidences of death in the medical arena, that there is a culture endorsing collective lying. There's a culture endorsing collective... Anyway... Inquiries into me, medico crime or medical malpractice in the UK seem to have been 
commandeered for political purposes, which is another thing I said in my last video that the last government wouldn't want Lucy Letby to be found innocent because then it would mean that their underfunding of the NHS was the cause of the deaths. And that wasn't something they needed to come out just before an election. But anyway, so commandeering for political purposes to rather than investigate the scale of the actual problem at hand or learn lessons on how to avoid it in the future, the inquiries seem des designed only to push through current health policy. The establishment wants the pu um, public to believe that since the Shipman case, it is now easier to detect when a health professional kills or sexual assaults a, a patient. It's a... It's good if the public think that there will never be another Shipman and Ben Gein and Colin Norris being jailed for 30 years apiece sent out the message as has the strings of doctors convicted of sexual assault. But statistics have shown that a GP would have to have a killing rate to rival Shipman in order to have any chance of coming to the attention of the criminal justice system. In fact, the case of Northumberland GP Dr David Moore, who openly admitted in the media to killing, sorry, helping to die around 300 patients in the media, he wasn't caught, reflects this. I argue in my book that it is not easier to detect a medico killer now since Shipman, but it is much more difficult for an innocent person de to defend themselves once accused of medico murder, as we've seen in the Lucy Letby case. You see, the thing is, it's just like the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement, not, I'm not saying it was a bad thing, but what it also did is it put innocent men in the crosshairs because it made it easier for women to make false allegations that men were sexually assaulting them or sexually harassing them, and nobody would question it. Suddenly, the Me Too meant that if somebody said something about a man, it was true. It didn't matter whether there was any evidence it didn't matter whether the person was lying, was known to be a serial liar. Um, all that mattered is it was a woman and she made the allegation, so it must be true. And I think this is what happens now when um, nurses are accused of harming patients. The second there's an accusation from someone senior in a hospital, it's suddenly a fact. There's no like doubt in anybody's mind that this really happened. And so they have no chance. Once a case goes to trial, they have no chance of being acquitted on the first trial. The only way the only way they've got of getting out of the situation is if the case is accepted by the Court of Appeal and they give it a bit more scrutiny. Because in in a actual criminal trial, both I would I would say the prosecution and this is my experience for, as being a, even a fraud officer. The prosecution is is very likely to hide any evidence that disproves their theory. They will not. They, they should. The law says that there should be a hundred percent disclosure of all evidence, but they are happy to lie and hide evidence and break the rules and break the law. And it's sad. But we've seen it already. We've seen it in Sally Clark's case. We've seen it in, um, what's, what's his name? Uh, Barry George's case. We've seen it in Lucy Letby's case. That they're happy to hide crucial evidence because it doesn't um, support their hypothesis. And then when there's an inquiry or a further investigation after the innocent person has gone to prison, all all the um, skeletons in the closet come out. But it's too late. This person is in prison now, and there's a hell of a process even to get the case back to the Court of Appeal. You know, a case that should never have been decided as guilty, because if the jury had had that information, they probably would never have come up with a guilty verdict. And now... Someone's got to wait 10 years for it to go through a court of appeal or actually be accepted by the court of appeal because you've got to make so many attempts before these ignorant public school toffs who are appointed by corrupt MPs um, decide 
that they're actually going to look at the case. Anyway, where did we get up to? Is this fiction? No, it's real life. Truth is stranger than fiction. This is the true story of Lucia the Burke, Ben Gein, Colin Norris, Susan Nels, and of course, Sally. I don't know if Sally Clark had been released at the time, but Sally Clark. This can happen to another innocent nurse somewhere in the world today. And when I say in the world, I mean in England, Scotland, or Wales, in Canada, Germany, France, in Norway, in Denmark, perhaps even in America. They seem to have more real serial killers there, but perhaps that is because they have the death penalty. And here's the bad news. Because of medical collegi well, collegiality, no medic is ever going to speak about this. There will not be a legal new fact. There is no reason whatsoever for the legal system to review the case. You're sunk, mate, up Shit's Creek without a paddle. Better to admit guilt and get the horror over with a bit sooner. So this was written by Richard Gill. I've heard his name in this case before. And he wrote this, as I said, in 2014. And just to tell you a little bit more about Richard Gill. From 1974, Richard Gill worked as an academic researcher and teacher in mathematical statistics in various research institutes and universities in the Netherlands. He was awarded a PhD in 1979 for work in the area of medical statistics and was the professor first at Utrecht and now at Leiden University. Richard is a past president of Dutch Statistical Society, a member of the Royal Dutch Academy of Science and is presently advising the Special Tribunal for Lebanon Statistics of Mobile Phone Metadata. So, you know, he's highly regarded around the world and he predicted this was going to happen to Lucy Letby two years before the first accusation against her came in. This, this whole thing is so upsetting. This whole thing hurts my heart every minute of every day. I was even, I was in a, a nightclub last night thinking about it. I don't go to nightclubs. I haven't been to a nightclub forever. And I was in a nightclub and I couldn't enjoy myself because I was thinking about this. I was, I was, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And, you know, we, we something just needs to happen. Something needs to, to change so that we don't have another Lucy Letby. You know, there, there's probably like five years time, 10 years time, there's going to be another, even if Lucy Letby is acquitted or not acquitted, um, exonerated by the Court of Appeal, in 10 years time, we're going to be doing the same thing again. And the person may be called Jane Doe. And we're going to be doing the same thing again. We're going to be doing, going over the same things. And who knows now, I'm going to have to look at the Ben Gein case. I might do a video about Ben Gein once I've done enough research um, to see whether I, ne I need to be fighting his corner too. And it's not, you know, I'm no superhero. I can't fight anyone's corner, really. All I can do is try and recruit the masses to 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 speak out because that's all we can do is speak out all we can do is speak out and embarrass these people who have um played a part in these miscarriages of justice you know we we are we have no powers we have no powers we are just the what would you call it the peasants <laughs> the peasants fighting for um truth and justice and i, I come from a background of people who fought for truth and justice um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Maroons, but in, in, during slavery in Jamaica, like people, people have the idea in their heads that the, 
the British decided to end slavery um, because they were nice people. That's not why the British Empire ended slavery. There were, there were a number of multiple reasons. I mean, obviously, they lost the War of Independence in America, and the slavery in America didn't end because of... Um, the, the, not because of the War of the Independence. Slavery ended in America because you had, in the south of America, you had lots of slave owners. And they basically had free labour. So they could undercut the north of America where there were no slaves. Or not many, many slaves at all. And so it was an economic war. The, the War of Independence. It was a war um, because the, the, the South of America, Southern America was mostly British um, or European landowners. And, you know, obviously America was under British rule and, and the North of America decided, well, you know, we we're being driven into poverty by this slave trade because we cannot compete. When we, when we, um, when we employ people, so white people, to work for us on our land, we have to pay the money. Whereas down south, the people have slaves, they don't have to pay them anything. So it's an unfair competition. And that's what brought the end to slavery in America. Now, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, where my parents are from, what they used to do, actually, in, in, within even in America but also all over the Caribbean, is all the most rebellious slaves, the ones who always fought back, ran away, they would take them to Jamaica. So Jamaica had all the toughest slaves, which was the biggest mistake. That's what brought an end to slavery, is putting all the tough slaves in Jamaica. And so what you ended up with were a group of um, slaves who were called the Maroons, and they used to go up into the mountains. They would escape from their owners, they would go up into the mountains and they would make weapons, they would build camps and as the British came onto the shore with slaves and things, they would attack them and they would free the slaves. And they started a massive war and they would go onto estates and I, I, I would urge you to watch um, a film, if I can remember, uh, a film called Birth of a Nation. If you, if you get a chance, watch this film called Birth of a Nation. Absolutely. This is, that's the true story of slavery. Not all this 10 years of slave nonsense where Brad Pitt comes along and helps to end slavery and all this nonsense. It's absolute cock, cock and bull, right? How black people ended slavery, right? We ended slavery. And what the Maroons did is that they attacked the British. And they, they started a war in Jamaica against the British and they were winning. They were winning. And so the, so the British government had to make a deal because they were worried that it was spread across all the islands. So they made a deal. And the deal was they would, instead of immediately ending slavery, they would give them an opportunity to work their way out of servitude. So for five years, they could work their way out of, um, what would you call it? Indentured. They, were inden they became indentured servants. And eventually they were supposed to get land. And my family got land from working their way out of slavery. And, and this brought an end to slavery because if, if the British hadn't made this deal with the Jamaican slaves, the British Empire probably would have got destroyed. It would have got destroyed. The country you know now as Great Britain would not exist, right? If, if we didn't, if my, and my family come from a f proud tradition of Maroons, you know, we, we, my, my grandparents, used to tell stories about how their grandparents fought um, against slavery. And, you know, my aunts and uncles used to tell me the stories that were told to them. And so I suppose that's why I've got this fighting spirit. I've always had this very strong fighting spirit against injustice. I can't, and it, it, you must inherit it somehow. And I must have inherited it from my ancestors who were slaves. And I don't care what the race, the creed, the colour, 
of a person is, if they're a victim of injustice, I will be there fighting for them. If I hear about it, I will be there writing letters to MPs. I will be there making complaints. I will be there going to court with people who are victims of injustice. You know, I'm no lawyer. I have no legal expertise as such. I understand the law. I've read up on the law, but I'm not a qualified lawyer. But I will fight as hard as I can. And I, I have no control over that. That's just who I am. You know, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's just what humans should do. We should all care about each other. We should all care about other people who are going through hard times. And what I like about having started this series of videos is I've come across very like-minded people. And most of those like-minded people I've come across are not black. You know, you don't have to be black to believe in justice. You don't have to be any particular colour. They're just people who have good hearts. And I hope I come across a lot more people with good hearts who um, are, are prepared to put their head above the parapet and and say what needs to be said about injustice and about the establishment, about corruption. Because the world needs to change from what it is now. It's going the wrong way. It's going in the very much the wrong direction. And we need to make an example for our children. And we need to, to leave the world a better place than the place we were born into. You know, that should be the mission of every single human being. To leave this earth much a much better place than what it was the day we were born. If your mission isn't that, you don't deserve to have life. And that may be a harsh thing for me to say, but, you know, that's what we should be working to do. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And I'm trying to do a video every single day. Today's easier because it's Sunday. I've not got a busy day. Next week, I've got some more filming on this TV show. So we'll see how much time I've got available to do videos. But, you know, once again, thank you for watching the video. I know I've waffled on. I've really waffled on. So thank you for per persevering with this um video and as usual please share the video click the like button and also subscribe if you haven't subscribed and i will be speaking to you again maybe later today maybe tomorrow maybe the day after but stay safe